Good morning everyone and welcome back to our continuing CPD series, this time all about waterproofing insurance, design with confidence. I am your host Andy Ferguson and joining me today to help put, I suppose, a capital C into the word confidence is senior PCA trainer, MD of Phil Hewitt Training, Michael Earl. Morning Michael. Morning Andy. How are you good sir? Uh, not too bad, all things considering. It looks like the weather's um, picking up a little bit this end, which, being someone that prefers it when it rains, because that's when the phone starts ringing, um, <laughs> it's a bit of an odd one. But, yeah, no, happy to be here. Yeah, well, I have to say, I'll even let everyone in a little secret. It's even sunny up in Scotland. I don't believe uh, it. You never know. You never know. I'm, I'm actually maybe going to turn from blue to white to brown. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you when I see it, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> but here, everyone, uh, if you're one of our regular listeners, a uh, big thanks for tuning back in with us. If you are one of our new listeners, well, a big, big welcome to you. We do hope you get some really good, valued learning from today and also that you enjoy the chat. Now, just um, some general kind of housekeeping, folks. Um, if you want to get engaged with us, if you want to chat with us, if you just want to say hello, and if you've got any questions over the course of the webinar, the first place I want to point you to is to the chat facility. Now, if you are on a desktop, depending on your settings, the chat functionality will either be to the left or the right. There is a, corner, there is a box there where it just simply says, take your comment and Feel free to just go in there, type hello, tell us where you are, you know, I mean, tell us where you're listening from. We are always keen to hear. If you're on a mobile device, then all you need to do is slightly scroll up just a tiny wee bit and you'll see that comment box that's in there. Again, feel free just to jump in there and say hello. If you are socially savvy, then you can also pose your questions via our social media channels, either via Twitter, LinkedIn, or Facebook, all you simply need to do is go on to those particular channels, hit that search functionality, and just type in Property Care Association, and we should pop up. Just use the appropriate um, buttons and, and mechanisms in there, tag is, whatever it might be. I am always listening, and just throw any questions and hello that way. Also, if you um, uh, if you don't necessarily want to use the chat functionality, you can email me directly and I can pose the questions over to Michael. My email address is just simply andy at property-care.org. That's andy at property-care.org. And uh, I will pretty much hoover it up. I can see that um, we're getting a lot of hellos on the chat at the moment in time. A big good morning to Oh, there's a, there seems to be quite a variety of people, even a couple of internationals, I think, on there. There you go, Michael, a couple of internationals. But folks, here, yeah, just also to let you know as well, I am acutely aware that at nine o'clock in the morning, there's all of a sudden a huge surge of individuals that are sticking on their PCs, going onto the internet. Now, I will say that in, um, in, in some areas for the very small number of you, you may have some issues, you know, just the uh, kind of sound or anything like that. Now, if that happens, you will see a reconnect button that will pop up on your screen. All you basically need to do is just refresh and we should kind of come up. What I have found is after about five minutes or so, when everyone have chucked, um, stuck up their PCs and everything's all going, it kind of Bring these out a little bit. So hopefully, hopefully, cross and fingers, no one has any problems this morning. Um, well, Michael, I think we've got a couple of minutes just um before we kind of do anything. Um I, 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 I <laughs> happens that last night I was actually going through the, the the training logs and looking at all the kind of comments that people were making towards our training courses and in particular your training courses and do you know it was lovely seeing all these kind of comments saying Michael was great training course was great really informative however there was one comment that stood oh, well, above the rest, above all, um, which basically said along the lines of, Michael Earl makes waterproofing sexy. Now, I have to ask, <laughs> what the heck were you doing in that particular training session? Did you have a board at onesie on that day? 
I think, well, um, anyone that's sat on some of my um, training courses will know I'm a bit informal sometimes with um, my analogies and how I explain things. Um, if give an example, there's one reference to when we're talking about condensation, um, mm -hmm. a, a bedroom scenario where someone maybe has a condensation issue on the window um, mm -hmm. on their own, they solve it, but maybe introduce somebody else to the bedroom, condensation problem comes back, just to give you a flavor of um how i help people remember it so when they're sitting in that exam um they're thinking of yeah their lifestyle <laughs> what, what you're basically saying is sex helps training it does yeah well, it also creates work <laughs> it's creating conversation problems so long may it continue although at social distance at the moment i don't know how that works but um <laughs> well do you know that is something we're actually looking at in the moment and i know sue who is on um, listening on at the moment time she's very much kind of diving into that at the moment and we are hoping folks to get our training back up and running and of course um doing it uh very safely as well so sue a big thumbs up to you for taking on that challenge um oh do you know something i learned about you yesterday as well oh, you know, which because I, I was all you probably noticed i was all over your linkedin profile last yeah, night yeah, I, was, I, I noticed i noticed you used to work with my new pal hudson uh hudson lambert yes yeah Seriously, yeah worked with safeguard for quite a, a long period of time it's where my main sort of um introduction into the waterproofing damp proofing industry came from so uh yeah i've got a lot of uh, respect and time for hudson and safeguard actually so yeah no no hudson well well, yeah, do you know, I mean, I always have a good laugh with Hudson, I have to say. Hudson, if you're tuning in, by the way, give us a wee yo. Um, but the last time I was actually with Hudson, he was winding me up big style because it just so happened I was staying in a particular hotel. And in that particular hotel, it was the most haunted room in the UK. And, you know, for the life of me, I can't actually remember that hotel. But Hudson <laughs> took great joy in winding me up. <laughs> the places you get taken to <laughs> yeah I, I can't remember what it is yet but uh, it will come to me but folks here yeah, just kind of jumping back to everyone because we're almost at that time and um, big hello to everyone that has joined us welcome to the latest in our cpd series uh which is all about waterproof insurance design with confidence um andy ferguson and joining me is senior pca trainer and md of phil hewitt uh, training michael earl we are about to start just before we start just for everyone that just joined us there if you are um uh, if you have any questions over the course of the webinar if you have if you just want to say hello you can use the chat facility if it's on the desktop it's just the left or the right there if it's in a mobile, you just need to pull it up. But you can also email uh, any questions, just myself at andy at property-care.org. And uh, I will basically pose those questions right at the end. Well, folks, I can actually see it is just turned nine o'clock. I suppose we're at that time where we can start. And I suppose it's maybe um, to that point, Michael, we're throwing it over to yourself. How do we create waterproofing design that follows recommended best practice and keeps warranty providers happy? And do we really understand what insurance and warranty providers really want? Big questions, Michael. Over <laughs> to yourself to answer. Thank you, Andy. Hopefully, um, I've got the answers to them. Um, so, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to be looking after you for the next um, hour, hour. So, looking at what we're going to be discussing today, a uh, very brief introduction to myself, and we're going to very briefly look at what BS8102 says about a certain things which underline all insurance uh, requirements, warranty requirements, and to a point, design requirements. So we'll touch on that first, just to get everybody warmed up. Um, following that, we're gonna look more specifically at the warranty providers out there, and in particular, some of the major ones, NHBC, NABC Premier are probably the most um, common ones. There are others out there. Um, effectively, if these people are involved with a scheme where waterproofing is a requirement, they have prescribed requirements as to what they need in order to be able to, to warranty and ensure effectively that property. So I want to look at those and see how those requirements feed down into your design. Whether you're a consultant designer, you might be a contractor going onto a scheme where there's a warranty provider involved, you could be an architect or an engineer. There's several bodies which may be influenced by these requirements. And it obviously has an effect on other trades as well, structural finishes even. So we'll look at those. 
Um, we'll touch on insurance back guarantees and professional indemnity. Now, I'm by no means an expert in insurance, but um, I just want to give you a flavour of what's out there, some of the options, maybe some of the things you should be looking for um, if you're a customer, a client, or if you're actually providing a service as well. So we'll look at those, and then we'll finish off with just a summary of how, hopefully, at the end of this, you'll be able to design with some confidence um, if you're not already going forward. So looking at a uh, brief introduction to myself, obviously a very recent photo as you can see from me um, here now, excuse the comb over lockdown haircut. Um, my name is Michael, um, I used to work for a company called Safeguard, I was pursuing uh, a career in medicine believe it or not, um, but failed miserably so I jumped from that and to keep my hand in sort of the science um, side of things I looked for a local job and found a role as a research and development um, member of staff at Safeguard Europe down in West Sussex, uh, working in their lab, developing things and um, researching things for woodworm, rising damp treatments and things like that. Um, whilst there, uh, for a number of years, uh, the waterproofing sector grew, if you like, and they brought in someone called Phil Hewitt, who respectfully was probably one of the um, best waterproofing consultants, but certainly in the UK, uh, and was pivotal in moving some ways that we look at waterproofing around. Uh, they brought him in to train me, um, which I was very, very um, honoured to have that done, and we got a repair going up, and ultimately when he decided he'd rather be on a golf course and cruising around the world, well, before it has happened, um, he asked me if I would like to look after the practice. And with the blessing of Safeguard, I did so. And I now run effectively Phil Hewitt Associates, although myself, Michael, I'm the only person here, I'm, I'm the sole employee. So I look after it and I'm effectively an independent consultant. So I don't work or have any ties with any manufacturers, um, suppliers, installers, anything like that. So I sit outside, which enables me to do quite a lot of um, good things for people who maybe don't want to be tied to one person. So for example, um, training is a big part of what I do, um, mainly for the PCA. So I'm able to stand up in front of a classroom of people and talk about all of the options, not necessarily, I'm not saying that other people do this, but not with some influence in terms of looking to sell you something at the end of it. So I'm there um, as a blank sheet of paper effectively. Um, another thing I do is design work. Um, so I carry out design works for quite a few house builders, um, private individuals, um, and probably my favourite part of my job is litigation, when things go wrong. So hopefully not go wrong, but when they do, um, sometimes an expert witness is needed, someone who's impartial, who's not involved with any of the parties uh, to come along. So that's actually quite a big source of where I get most of my ex extra knowledge, because actually I find, unfortunately, when something's gone wrong, that's the best place to learn. So litigation is somewhere I, I, I hang around quite a lot. Site surveys um, as well, if um, there's a, a failure on site or if it's new build or even an existing basement that's being refurbed, um, I often go and have a look and see what can be done, what options there are, rather than maybe um, going along one route, are there different um, available options to there. So I, I cover quite a wide range of um, consultancy in the waterproofing sector. Um, if you need to get hold of me for any reason, I'm more than happy to chat through anything informally, um, and my details are all at the bottom there. So about did you? So. I found this statistic on LinkedIn. It was published by um, a waterproofing supplier slash contractor um, in the UK. Um, and I've searched around the internet to try and find where its source was without success. But just to put it out there in case it is um, substantial, waterproofing makes up roughly 1% of the total cost of building construction, but can account for up to 80% of construction repairs and litigation. Now, when I saw that, initially I was taken back a little bit, so I thought that's a massive number in comparison to what actually the cost of waterproofing is. But then when I thought about it a little bit, actually it doesn't seem that crazy, having seen some of the waterproofing claims um, that I've been involved in and that have gone through. Um, with in mind, I think that this statistic also includes things like waterproofing balconies, roof terraces, podium decks, which we've, there's been a webinar on podium deck failures and things like that as well. So all of those thrown in. So that statistic I do think is not far off the mark, um, but it just sort of gives you a, a, a frame, an idea of where we are uh, with waterproofing failures. Now, as I mentioned, very, very briefly going to look at the standard we use or the benchmark standard we use in the UK to look when we look at waterproofing or more specifically protecting below ground structures from water that originates in the ground and BSA 102 the 2009 edition is the main one most people will look at now we're going to be looking at the warranty providers in a little bit 
um, and effectively what they do in a very simplified term is they will take the, the standards as we have them, so the British standard, for example, and they have layers, if you like, on top of it. Now, the idea is that's improving the state of the job or the design that comes out as a result. And as a result of improving it, the idea is hopefully that any risk of it failing is reduced. So effectively, this is the, the benchmark, the foundations, and then the standards build on top of that. Now, in my opinion, that's a good thing, um, because obviously it's improving standards, which is NHBC's actual tagline. Um, but we're gonna look at BSA 1 or 2 just briefly to set um, some terms in place. So the rest of this, hopefully, if you're a bit new to BSA 102 and waterproofing, makes a bit more sense. So one of the first things that BSA 102 outlines is the different forms of waterproofing that you can adopt uh, when looking at protecting structures from water. And it categorizes them into three types, A, B, and C. Type A on the left hand side there is known as a barrier material and in the example I show it shows it applied externally. It could be something like a physical membrane, um, a self-adhesive membrane, a coating, a liquid, a render, something which inhibits the movement of water through it effectively. Now that can be situated on the outside which isn't too uncommon on new builds. Could be applied to the inside mainly with refurbs possibly so certainly face you've got access to or in some circumstances it might be in a sandwich scenario so it might be within the structure itself um, between two walls or something like that. The other form is type B protection known as integral and this is where the structure itself is doing the work so in the example I'm showing there we have water resistance waterproof concrete with the associated water bars hydrophilic strips in the joints there are other types of integral protection where the structure is doing the waterproofing, something like sheet, steel sheet piling, where it's been welded shut, uh, that can be considered a form of waterproofing as well. And finally, on the right hand side, we have cavity drainage. Um, in the example shown there, we have a dimpled membrane, a crate membrane, which would have associated channels and pipes leading to somewhere of discharge, so a pump system or in some cases, if it's appropriate by gravity. Um, another form of cavity drainage I'm seeing grow in popularity, which um, may feed into what the warranty providers are, are, are asking for, is a drain void. So rather than adopting and paying for something like a dimpled membrane, they're actually just using a cavity construction as a drained element instead, which also has some benefits, but also has some negative sides to it as well. So we might touch on that if we have time. And the last bit about BSA 102 I just want to touch on is the performance of the structure. Now this will feed through all of the warranty providers. They're, they're very prescriptive in if this is what you're looking to achieve, i.e. a dry environment or a damp environment, how does that affect how you approach your design? How many forms of waterproofing do you need? What types do they accept? So forth and so on. Now, in terms of BSA 102, we've got the three grades, one, two, three, and very basically as the number goes up, the degree of dryness also goes up. So one effectively is a wet environment, two is a damp environment, and three is a dry environment. And I've put a arrow there highlighting car parking, referring down to grade two. Now the reason I've done that is as we go through some of the warranty providers requirements, a lot of them stipulate that as a minimum they require a grade two from waterproofing and I'm still picking up quite a lot of designs which have been taken to a certain degree by an architect or an engineer and quite fairly they've picked up BSA 102 um, and maybe some other associated documents and they've specified that the car park should be waterproofed to achieve a grade one environment which you can see from the performance level on the top right hand corner of that graph or that chart it says that some seepage and damp is tolerable now, when I'm ever at a design team meeting, um, regardless if a warranty provider is um, involved or not, and they're looking at designing a car park, for example, uh, and they've specified they're looking to achieve a grade one, I'll ask them what they understand that to be. And they say, and actually very, very confidently tell me that means that some seepage and damp will be tolerable. Now, the example I give when I'm doing the training courses is if you imagine I've got an 80 space underground car park, so 80 car park spaces, and I pay someone, so I'm a main contractor, and I pay someone to come along and provide me a waterproof concrete box effectively. So I've paid for waterproof concrete, but it's been specified to achieve a grade one environment. Now, let's say for 79 of those car park spaces, there is no problem. There's a little bit of dampness because cars bring in rain and snow and stuff like that. So it's achieving a grade two in that there's no water leaking through the structure. However, let's say in 
parking bay 80 there's a very small leak every time it rains and a very minor puddle forms in that corner now if i was the owner of that car parking bay every time i get out of my car i trod in a puddle of water i probably wouldn't be too happy with that so i'd maybe make some complaints However, when you get back to the waterproofing warranty, let's say, if it's been warranted as a grade one environment, technically speaking, it could be argued that in the scheme of that 80 space car park, that little leak on one parking bay would be considered seepage in the overall scheme. Now, is that what the ultimate client was looking for? Probably not. And to a degree, if you're paying for waterproofing, waterproof concrete, a membrane, something like that, why would you pay for it with the remit that it might leak at a later date? It, it seems a bit two steps forward, one step back to me. So we always try, or I always personally try to encourage people to look at grade two as the minimum them, especially if you're introducing waterproofing um, and then go from there and you'll see that filters through the warranty providers uh, requirements as well so just briefly the one two three we will touch on those um, a bit more as we go through so the actual warranty providers themselves now i've put the three main ones up here probably the one most people are familiar with is nhbc the national house building council um, there are two other big players out there um, lebc warranty providers and premier guarantee now they're both if you like underwritten by mdi insurance services part of the mdis group so if you look at the manuals so basically their bibles is how they ask you to build certain things uh, they're pretty much a mirror image of each other that's because they, they both come from the same source um, i believe they've got these two companies because it helps them cover most of the market so from high-end commercial to housing and so forth and so on generally speaking um, you will obtain a 10-year warranty house building warranty structure warranty from these providers um, so to give you an example if i was a house builder building 800 houses and i wanted to effectively and i put this in very loose terms i effectively want to finish a job and walk away um, with liabilities being reduced so i can go on and do other things without having to worry about something going wrong elsewhere i can pay a warranty provider a premium obviously um, to take over some of those liabilities once I've finished the scheme. Now, in order for that warranty provider to take on that liability, obviously they're going to want to reduce their liabilities, the risk of something happening as much as possible. And in order to do that, they require the builder to do certain things, normally above and beyond um, the standards for building regs and the British standards to obviously help reducing that risk. Now, if I've done all that uh, as a house builder, the warranty providers supervised, checked it all off, and they've signed it off effectively. I will then walk away, but for the first two years, I will still be liable for the majority of any defects that happen within that development. It will be from years three to 10 that the warranty provider would step in should there be a problem. So that's just to put you in a frame of what these warranty providers are effectively um, there for. And they all, all the ones I've come across, a few other ones, ICWs out there, um, Build Safe is another one. So it's not just those three I mentioned, there are other ones out there. They all, to a degree, stipulate the conditions and what they require in terms of the waterproofing. And very often, they will identify a particular person, um, a waterproofing design specialist, and they've abbreviated it because why not? Because we haven't got enough abbreviations in this industry as it is. So why not just have another one? So, waterproofing design specialist. And they identify this person as someone that will often lead the design, as BSA 102 actually recommends, um, to specify materials, um, look at the waterproofing elements, but ultimately someone to take responsibility um, to be that named person or body that is responsible for that element. Historically, and I'm, I'm happy to say talking quite a few years ago now, sort of uh, seven, ten years plus, there was uh, a very common um, reaction to waterproofing, where if something went wrong, they would try and find out and establish whose responsibility it was. Very often the contractor probably wouldn't be taking responsibility for the design because maybe they've taken a design that the architect's given them. The architect would said they're not qualified in the waterproofing, it was only an intent. The structural engineer would say, it's something to do with me, I'm to do the structure, and ultimately it would vanish. So they wouldn't have any recourse if something went wrong. So actually identifying this person um, 
it benefits everybody effectively um, and hopefully identifies a correct person to lead that waterproofing design. And just an example on the left hand side there, um, it's not uncommon now, especially for warranty providers involved, to see some form of statement um, or reference to a waterproofing designer. So in this particular example here, um, we've got a, a name, a position, company they work for uh, of that CSSW, that waterproofing designer in this particular case. So just a very brief uh, poll question. So I'll get Andy to help in a second here, but uh, just interesting to think what the audience thinks about this point. So for habitable spaces, which is a grade three, so dry, usable, habitable space, what are the minimum amount of waterproofing forms needed? So I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer, but I'm just interested to see what you come back with. So Andy, can I hand over to you to run that poll? Yeah, sure, folks. Well, folks, hopefully, crossing fingers, you will have seen a wee pop-up that would have popped up on your screen. If you're on a desktop, it should just pop up right in front of you. If you're on a mobile, it might be you just need to slightly scroll up. I can see that we are getting answers that are coming in just at the moment in time. There is a bit of a lag between our live stream and what people are kind of listening to, folks. So I'm just going to just uh, draw it out just a little bit and probably just keep this going for about another 30 seconds. Um, Michael, the one thing I will say is there is one huge clear winner, which you can probably guess, but let's not tell them the answer just at the moment in time. Let's kind of keep it going. The, but yeah, there's certainly, certainly most people seem to have kind of picked up on one particular answer. So, um, Guys, I'm just going to keep this going for maybe about another 15 seconds. So if you want to get involved in the poll, now is the time to do it. So just kind of get fired in. Just going to give it about another five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And I'm just going to end the poll. And Michael, as you probably will have guessed, <laughs> answer number two is at, um, uh, at 63% was the clear winner. Um, just to kind of give you a wee rundown, folks, of just the results in case you can't actually see it on your screen. Um, uh, answer number one for one, 13 percent. Answer number two, uh, 63 percent. Um, folks that said three, 14 percent. And the folks that said three plus eight percent. Over to yourself, Michael. Cheers, Andy. Thanks for that. Um, I'm not surprised by that result. I'm interested to see the 8% who think you need more than three. Um, obviously, a uh, very safe scheme. Um, but We'll leave us some time. Um, two forms, obviously, overwhelmingly won there at 63%. Um, and it's a bit of a leading question, really. So I did ask, what are the minimum amount of waterproofing forms needed? And technically speaking, if the risks are deemed low enough, you could just have one form. And I, I've actually very happily done some designs where just one form has been adopted in a very low risk scenario. However, there are stipulations and it's mainly been born from the warranty providers where in grade three environments under a certain depth, they then require the two forms of waterproofing. Now, I've actually done some work, um, litigation work, where I've had to respond to a question where the builder was being, the claim was against the builder saying they'd failed in their duty because they'd only used one form of waterproofing in a grade three environment and BSA 102 clearly says you should have two forms or more in a, a grade three. Now, technically speaking, that's not correct. BSA 102 says that two forms or more should be looked as an option where the risk of failure and so forth is deemed too high. So as a strict answer, the minimum amount would be one, but I fully appreciate and I'm fully support the fact that if you're in a habitable space, two does make complete sense because generally speaking, as soon as you get to a grade three environment, you're looking at things like finishes, um, equipment, things like that, which if obviously they get damaged, the consequence is going to be quite high. So two, I agree with. I was just interested to see where people sat with that. So thank you. Um, we'll move on now. So looking at NHBC now in a bit more detail and jumping straight in, their 
um, waterproofing requirements are covered by their chapter 5.4. And the first thing they identify is one of the people that should be involved in the waterproofing. So very briefly, as you can see here, I've taken these from the chapter, waterproofing systems should be designed by a waterproofing design specialist, which was that abbreviation we looked at earlier on. And they identify some qualifications like CSSW, Certificated Surveillance Structural Waterproofing, as one of those appropriate people. Following on from that, they actually give you a shopping list, if you like, of what is required in terms of that waterproofing um, document, that, that, that design document that goes forward. And we've got things like set of drawings, joints, penetrations, the manufacturer's information. There might be things like BBA certificates, an installation method, which we'll touch on again a bit later, um, a ground condition report. Now, for those of you that have had the joy of looking through a site investigation report, some of them can be pretty short, which is very rare, but it can happen. Most of them are a reasonably heavy document. Some of them come in volumes, um, like War and Peace, you get several versions of them. Um, very often that won't be in the waterproofing designer's report, the actual physical um, site investigation, but they should certainly be making reference to it. So they should be saying, I've had sight of a site investigation report, and these are the relevant pieces of information which I'm using as part of my design rationale. So that should be in there. Um, and details of the waterproofing design specialist, dare I say, so if something goes wrong, they know who is responsible for that element. Or you may have done a really good job and they want to use you again. So your details should be on there as well. Um, NHBC uh, very helpfully give some section drawings where they show where waterproofing may or may not be required or may should be at least be considered. Now, to give you an example, I was going to run through this quite quickly, but in these examples here, you can see there's a solid red line where it goes from effectively just above external ground level, so damp proof course, um, down into the ground. Now, a solid red line dictates that in NHBC's eyes, that waterproofing is a requirement in those scenarios. So clearly these are both underground structures so waterproofing would be required in those um, elements. Looking at these two here on the right hand side we have a lift pit so it might just be a very flat site no retaining elements no basement scenarios or anything like that but you may have a lift pit or multiple lift pits. According to chapter 5.4 then all the requirements of that chapter come into play if there is simply a lift pit. So that means um, someone building a development with a lift pit with no basement, however they've got a lift pit, would have to technically employ someone to carry out that waterproofing design. Now, the warranty providers, although they have got this relatively prescriptive way of looking at how to achieve the, their standards, they're, they're not very astute, that's how it's got to be. They are open to discussion and if the risks and design elements fit, then they will consider them. So that's not necessarily an issue. Now, looking at the left-hand side, this is very um, common where we've actually got not a full basement effectively, but maybe a partially retaining structure. So maybe it's built on a slope or something like that. Obviously, the retaining wall to the left-hand side is a solid red line, but now we have a dotted red line along the floor. Now, the dotted red line notifies an area where waterproofing should be considered. Now, it's very common that a structure like that may have a beam and block floor so you wouldn't effectively carry a form of waterproofing across a beam and block floor but obviously you'd have to make sure the levels were correct to make sure that that void doesn't fill up with water and all these consequences as well so it's something that the designer should take on board and determine do i need waterproofing there or not um, light wells on the right hand side there so maybe it's an external patio area or courtyard area obviously that retaining wall um, to stop water coming through it has got a form of waterproofing. On the left hand side you may have external staircases, this may be to adopt changes in level between properties, there may be a retaining element underneath that which obviously results in a solid red line but then we have a dotted red line uh, across the floor because again that may not be effectively subject to water pressure so it may not need it. Again something for the waterproofing designer to pick up on. And looking at these ones on the right hand side, split level properties. Now, these aren't that uh, uncommon, they happen quite a lot. Um, effectively, you've got a void created there and they've maintained a dotted red line throughout. Now, if they, they've got a little vote, uh, uh, note here saying structures adjacent to voids where water may accumulate. If it can be demonstrated that that void won't accumulate water, so either as a confident assessment of the ground assessment 
or if there's something in there to tangibly remove that accumulation of possible water, something like land drainage, for example, then effectively you remove the retaining element. And if you haven't got a retaining element, that means the waterproofing can be uh, possibly omitted. I'm not saying every case, but possibly omitted, hence the dotted red line. Now, following that on, if you look at the left hand side, we've got this stepped um, terrace properties where there's a drop between each one. According to the chapter, if you have a drop greater than 150 mil, then that upstand, if you like, that vertical line becomes solid red, which means waterproofing should be applied there. However, going across the floor, we've got a dotted line, which means waterproofing should be considered. Now, if this was a ground bearing slab, then it may be that waterproofing is needed throughout that whole section. However, if you've got beam and block floors and they've created um, sloped voids underneath them, effectively you, you're approaching something similar to what's on the right hand side. So again, if you can demonstrate that water won't accumulate uh, or as a result of the ground conditions, you're confident that won't happen, you may be able to emit or reduce waterproofing requirements in those scenarios. And finally, on the left hand side, a buried podium, very obviously underground. Um, not only are we dealing with the walls and floors, we've now got a podium element as well, which I mentioned as a webinar a few weeks ago done by Ben, uh, which is very useful in terms of what to avoid and what to look for with those. On the right hand side, we have a floor level that may be below damp proof course. Now, generally speaking, obviously we avoid these where possible and we have floors at DPC or above and so forth. Where this does come in though, is where we have things like level access. So to comply with things like part M of building regs for access into buildings, you may have a part of the external ground level which ramps up to enable someone to gain like a wheelchair access into the property. This again, similar to the lift bit scenario, could mean that you have a scheme which in the whole of it doesn't have a basement scenario or retaining section. However, if you have these localized areas where the external ground level is too high, um, a waterproofing design and designer may need to be uh, involved. So just as a brief review of what's out there. Now, going on, uh, again, this is taken from NHBC's chapter. Waterproofing design should be appropriate to the risk and generally assume exposure to a full height of water during the existing design life of the building, which isn't too dissimilar from what BS8102 says. At some point in the structure's life, you assume a head of water will occur. And it then stipulates for a grade three environment, so a habitable space, if it's retaining more than 600 mil, a combination system is required, and that is uh, two forms of waterproofing minimum. Now, I've put there, what is a combined system um, in bold? And the reason I put that there is, I've had this conversation a couple of times. When we talk about combined protection, um, what most of us will be thinking about is two forms of protection at any one point. So I've got a complete waterproof concrete box, and inside of that, I've got a complete cavity drain system. So a type B and a type C system. So at any one point, I've got two forms of protection. What it isn't alluding to is something like a, let's say, render, a waterproof render on the walls and a cavity drain system on the floor. So we've got a type A system on the walls and a type C system on the floor. In technical terms, we have got a combination of waterproofing because we've got two forms. However, at any one point, we've only got one actual form of defense, which isn't what it's asking for. So making sure we're talking about the same thing as, as we go through the process. So the options that are provided to us, if you mix the, the three forms together are A, B, A, C, and A, B, C. So they're the only ones you can get. I have tried and not successfully so far to get a type A and a type A through. Two forms of waterproofing, it's only for a lift pit in, in the case I've done it, um, but I'm not accepting it. So, but they're the three combinations uh, they're generally looking for. And just to give you a very brief idea of what these might look like, type A and a type B. So we've got a waterproof concrete structure with our associated water bars. Most of the warranty providers prefer a kicker, that upstand at the bottom there to be used. So in terms of um, working with the structural engineers um, and the build process, that, that, that should be included. So we've got our type B structure with a type A in this example on the outside. That type A could also be on the inside as I described earlier on. It's not uncommon now, and I'll say this very briefly, for that type A material in these scenarios also to be looked at as maybe some form of contamination barrier as well. So, I mean, that's a topic for another day, um, but very often you may find type A forms of waterproofing performing two roles, uh, as it were. Type A and type C. So in this case here, we've got an external type A, the blue line with a cavity drain system on the inside. So uh, water management system. 
And finally, type B and type C. So waterproof concrete structure with a waterproof, uh, with a cavity drain system along the bottom. At the top of this section, we've also got a red line where there's a slight podium um, detail going on. And that red line would be suggesting they're putting a barrier system up there. So effectively a type A. Now, if you wanted to, you could describe this as a triple safe system. So I've got, we've got all the forms of waterproofing, we've got A, B, C, can't go wrong, blah, 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 blah. When in real terms, the only place we've actually got the benefit of all three forms of waterproofing is at that pile cap. So where we've got the cavity drain system on the inside, the pile cap itself, and then the barrier system just on the outside. The actual majority of the basement structure itself is only benefiting from the type B and the type C, and the podium is only benefiting from the type A. So you've got a, a combination of a combination, as it were. So again, making sure everyone understands what you're trying to achieve and why you're doing things the way you're, you're doing them. So still with NHBC, alternatively, where the builder can demonstrate the water table is permanently below the lowest floor slab, a type B system is acceptable for a grade three without further protection from a combined system. Now, very briefly, all this is saying is if the developer can demonstrate to NHBC that the water table is permanently going to be below the lowest ground slab, which I appreciate some of you have um, qualms whether or not that's possible or not, they will look at accepting a type B system, so waterproof concrete as an example, on its own. So without the benefit of a, a type A or a type C on top of it. Now, in order to demonstrate that to an HBC, uh, there should be a hydrogeological assessment, obviously, which would be part of the ground investigation normally, but it should be carried out for over a period of a year and normally uh, having results from water monitors every three months as a minimum. Now, I don't know many developers, uh, especially the large house builders, who will sit on a site potentially for every year to just demonstrate that the water table is permanently below what they're proposing to build in order to avoid having to put two forms of waterproofing in. They may think there's a cost saving to begin with, but when you look at that time scale, actually just getting on with the job might be a better forward. But the option is there, so um, you, can't, you can't argue against it really. And finally, uh, another stipulation they say, where grade two waterproofing is required, so something like a lift pit, for example, uh, or I mentioned car parks earlier on could, could fall into this, ground, uh, where it's a grade two and it's retaining more than 600 mil, type A systems that are not fully bonded should only be used as part of combined protection. So as an example, they've actually given a definition of a fully bonded barrier um, underneath the drawings there. A type A barrier that forms part of a composite structural wall includes liquid and cementitious systems, post-applied sheet membranes are not considered fully bonded. Now effectively what this is saying is if you've got a car park which is deeper than 600 mil and you're trying to achieve a grade two environment, you couldn't opt for a post-applied self-adhesive membrane on the outside on its own. That wouldn't be acceptable in terms of NHBC. You could still use it, but you'd have to um, add in a second form of waterproofing to back it up or to benefit it, like a waterproof concrete or a cavity drain system, for example. The photo on the right hand side with the tick next to it, that's a, a bentonite carpet system. In this particular tape case, it's pre-applied, so the concrete will form an integral bond with it, or should do. In that case, it becomes a composite material with a structural wall. So if that was a grade two car park deep in the 600 mil, because the membrane is now considered fully bonded, that would be considered acceptable on its own. So it's just something to, to keep an eye on if you're doing something as simple as a, a lift pit. If they're more than 600 mil deep, you may be limited uh, to a certain degree in what you can introduce. Good, okay, that's a win we'll stop tour of NHBC. Now we're looking at LABC and Premier very briefly. As I said, the, the, the manuals are effectively the same. Uh, the part of the MDIS group, and you can see both examples of the manuals there, both of them cover waterproofing in chapter 6.1. So NHBC was 5.4, um, LABC and Premier it's 6.1, and again, it goes through stipulations of what's required in terms of the waterproofing. Now, I've just dropped these in here. Uh, I'm not gonna go through them reading word for word, but effectively, very similar to the other warranty providers, they identify a person to carry out the design, so someone with CSSW, as an example, a waterproof design specialist, um, but they also mention professional indemnity, which I don't see mentioned in many of the other warranty providers, so basically having insurance for uh, the, the, the process, the duties that they're carrying out. They also stipulate that all basements should achieve a minimum of a grade two, except where defined elsewhere. So effectively, we mentioned those grades earlier on, they are reserving grade one environments for very specific um, scenarios. Now, 
just briefly, I wanted to show you where they mentioned land drainage. Now, um, land drains, according to their manual state, they should be used wherever possible. And that I don't necessarily agree with. If you can do something about the potential for groundwater pressure on the outside to remove it, that's got to be a good thing because you're going to reduce the ultimate risk of there being a leak should there be a problem with the waterproofing. It then goes on to say, if land drainage is not feasible, then a combination of at least two systems should be introduced. So effectively, this is where they're asking for two forms as a pre prescribed uh, requirement. So effectively, if you can't, for whatever reason, have external drainage, and it might be possibly to do with the form of construction as well. If you've got a piled excavation, uh, sheet piling or something like that, you may not be able to introduce external drainage. So that may force your hand or, or open you up to looking at two forms of waterproofing. So they are interlinked in terms of the LABC and Premier manuals. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, they stipulate everything should be designed to achieve a grade one at least. And for warranty purposes, as you see on these excerpts here, grade two as a minimum, grade three for occupied space. But the exception is where a space is solely used for underground car parking, they may accept a grade one um, uh, environment as a result. Now, that is, in my experience, done on a case by case basis. So you work with the site inspector and the site team and they'll, they'll work out the risks and so forth and work out because we, we do get high end car parks. So it might, although it's just a car park, not be appropriate to have a grade one environment. There is a, a side note to that grade one requirement in terms of plant rooms, which is the second paragraph there, where we've got plant rooms lift pits, escalators, access stair cores, things like that, they would have to achieve the grade two environment. They can't go to the grade one because they're not effectively car park spaces. It does also mention uh, plant rooms not used to house items directly for use with the house. Now, the reason that's in there, I believe, is because if you've got a plant room which has items which are serving the house as a building, you've probably got electrics down there, which may be suggesting a grade three environment. So just, it's always worth, right from the outset working out what people are expecting at the end because that'll ultimately provide you with the performance the grade you're looking for which ultimately is what's going to be warranted so are they warranting a grade one two three environment so it, it is vitally important from the outset that is agreed so everyone knows what's going to be effectively signed off at the end warranted um, again, just following on where they mentioned combined protection, if the requirements suggest, if the risk is high enough, so forth and so on, that two forms are required, um, then it does have this um, example, which is not too dissimilar to what we've already looked at. So type A, B, B, C and A, C. Um, they've mentioned the positioning of it all here in this drawing, we've actually got all three forms. So you've got A, B and C. Some scenarios um, ask for that, um, but effectively um, the option is in there. Generally speaking, they will, most of the warranty providers will rely on the advice from the waterproofing designer. So they carry quite a pivotal role. So to look at someone like myself or another CSSW person um, to help guide them as to what is appropriate for that scenario. And they've got the right to ask questions and uh, critique that design because obviously they're looking for it to not only achieve their chapter's requirements, but also provide them with a reasonable risk in terms of the finished product. So looking at um, insurance back guarantees very briefly, uh, the reason I've put this in here and uh, professional indemnity is because they all sort of come under insurance. When people talk about insurance, there's a few different things and items that people look at. So an insurance back guarantee, as I'm sure most of you are aware, is something which is in place. So should a contractor uh, installer not be able to fulfill uh, a guarantee requirement to so go back and resolve something that's gone wrong, maybe because of liquidation or ceasing to trade for whatever reason, um, the insurance policy will kick in and cover the end user uh, for that for that that job whatever work's been carried out um, obviously people issue guarantees in good faith um, hoping that they'll be around still but especially in current times um, who knows what's going to happen again there's a very small statistic at the bottom there I got from um, ONS where the construction industry saw in 2017 um, to over two and a half thousand companies construction specific companies um, going out of business which is about 50 a week so we're talking a few a day going out of business so it does happen although in good faith we don't expect it to but insurance back guarantees are there to protect the end user if you like in the event that the contractor can't uh, fulfill the requirements with the guarantee the normally for 10 years, um, it varies depending on what the type of work is. So anything from wall tie replacement, damp proofing, waterproofing, depending on what's going on, um, will determine how long the guarantee is for. Um, there are some uh, 
reinspection fees involved. Um, you have to ensure you have all the paperwork correctly put together. And there are also some limitations as to what that uh, guarantee will cover. So for example, finishes, consequential loss, there, there may be questions whether or not they're covered or not. Um, I've put their large projects over 50,000 have to be vetted, um, especially for waterproofing. Um, if a contract goes over the 50,000 pound value, um, they actually ask an independent party to look at that scheme to work out uh, if there's any caveats that should be attached to it or to make sure it obviously fits it in place. So it's like a, a security blanket for the insurance company. And on the previous slide, um, it mentions GPI insurance at the bottom right corner. That's probably the one most people are common with. So they are out there. It's a different type of insurance from what the warranty provider providers provide, um, but it is um, something which uh, I'd recommend, if, especially if you're an end user, uh, you ask for. So professional um, indemnity. Now, this covers financial loss um, if you're negligent in your act. And I know, especially in the waterproofing forum meetings I've been to, PI insurance does come up quite regularly as a discussion topic. Now, there's different forms of policies for PI insurance. Um, one of the ones most people should be looking for is um, the second, the third bullet point there, sorry, each and every claim basis. So effectively, if, you, if you've got an insurance policy, a PI cover policy for 5 million, if you've got an each and every claim basis, that effectively means that every client you work for, which that PI policy would be writing under, has access to 5 million pounds. So 5 million, 5 million, 5 million, 5 million. So obviously that could, hopefully not, if you've got lots of claims against you, um, get quite expensive for an insurer. Another Another um, term that is used is uh, a one amount basis known as aggregate. So effectively, if I had that five million pound uh, PI policy in a one amount basis, it means I've only got five million in any one policy. So if I had two people trying to sue me for whatever reason, God forbid, um, they would both have to share effectively that five million. So they couldn't get five million each. They'd have a proportion of it each um, up to that five million pound limit. So most insurers, if you look at collateral warranties and stuff like that, and what people ask you to sign in, to, it's not uncommon for them to stipulate they want you to have an each and every um, claim basis. If you're also having issues, maybe your PI is not as high as somebody would like it to be, um, it might be worth pointing out that it is an each and every claim basis, so that effectively someone else can't eat into that, that pot of money effectively, that might help you um, satisfy them you've got enough. Um, one thing some people miss out on is that the cover amount should be maintained for the period of whatever contract you signed up for. Now, normally with contractual agreements, it's 12 years. So if I went to a builder and they said, we want you to have a 20 million pound PI policy, and I go, yep, yeah, because I really want a job. Maybe the job's worth quite a bit of money to me. So I pursue a 20 million pound PI. My premium goes up maybe 20 grand or something like that, which is fine because the job in that year covers that premium. That's great, but I've now got to maintain that 20 million pound PI policy with that 20 pound extra premium for the next uh, 11 years. Now, obviously, I might not have contracts which satisfy the premium and, and um, basically, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Satisfy it, so make, make, make it worthwhile. So just be very wary if you are increasing your PI that you, you're aware you'll have to maintain it for a period of time afterwards. Uh, and it, it could be until basically you choose to retire or something like that. So just be careful of that. And uh, as a side note, if you're a contracting firm um, and you carry PI for, because you do the design work and you have your own guys install it, just check that your PI covers throughout all the whole process. Um, some contractors will have PI, but often it won't cover the work that's actually carried out on site. There'll be caveats against it. So I can't say for sure, so I'm not an expert in that side of things, but just check if you are a contractor carrying PI insurance, thinking it covers you as a building firm as well, an installation firm, just make sure that's the case. Normally there'll be combination policies to do that, not PI solely. So just um, check that just in case. Um, Policy premiums are based on the area of work, obviously. So waterproofing, for example, something like a CSW qualification or another relevant qualification can help bring those premiums down. So to make you a, least, a less risky party in that process. Um, also, if you work for a big organization where maybe you've got several bodies involved, different fields of expertise, damp proofing, timber proofing, all these sorts of things, you may be able to discuss with your broker that if only certain people deal with the waterproofing, they may be able to lower that risk. So the premium may come down as well. Can't 
can't guarantee it. But if you say only these named individuals are allowed to do the waterproofing design, for example, that may assist in lowering the premium. Like I said, can't guarantee, but it's worth um, investigating. I know quite a few people are struggling with the, the PI premiums at the moment. As I mentioned on earlier on, Premier Guarantees and LABC currently stipulate, stipulate you need it. Um, although obviously if you're doing this sort of work, you should have it anyway. NHBC don't currently mention it, but it's likely your client will. I'm always asked for PI evidence of. Um, it's funny enough, not always at the beginning. Sometimes I start a job and then they ask for the PI, um, maybe halfway down the road, which is uh, unusual. It should be asked from the beginning, but um, that is out there as well. So just as another, Brief question, not something there's a, I'm going to say is a correct answer for, but what value of PI do you think you should have? And Andy, I think we've got a few options available for them. We certainly do, folks. That um, that poll question should now be up on your screen. Um, it should come up as a pop-up. Um, if you're on the mobile, you might need to slightly scroll down. Again, I'm just going to give it about 30 seconds or so. And again, it's just to do with that slight time lag with individuals um, just slightly behind um, where we are and kind of listening to it. You can hear them stumbling against my words, folks. That's just not enough coffee this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're getting a good response coming in. Again, Michael, I think you can Again, yeah. get the answers coming through. I'm not going to see the answer because um, I don't want to taint the results. I'm just going to give it about another 10 seconds or so, folks. So if you want to answer the poll question, now is the time to do it. Just do it five, four, three, two, one. And I am just going to be ending the poll now. Um, there is effectively one clear winner. That winner being five million at 62% of the vote. Um, one million coming in at 11%, 10 million coming in at 19%, and only 6% saying 10 million plus. Over to yourself, Michael. Thank you, Andy. Um, that is effectively what i was expecting to see um, as a result of doing this um five million i don't think is a bad idea however it does all come down to what you actually do uh, and what level of uh, work and risk you're situating at um just keep in mind if you do carry high premiums if you you're asked to get high premium you have got to then maintain that premium going forward by far probably the most common level i see people at is five million um although it's not uncommon to see people at one million um if i'm honest but five million if i was starting out new or looking at a reasonable level to maintain myself at uh, 5 million. Um, just so you're aware, if you do fall short of the PI requirement, uh, maybe it's a very large job, uh, you, you're probably completely appropriate to carry out the works, uh, design works, for example, um, but your PI might not cover it. There are some schemes where they have an overriding policy. So the ultimate client effectively will take out a PI policy to cover the building as a whole. So you may go in into that as well, which you should be informed about. But it's, it's not always a dead end, um, but just uh, be wary about if you do take out higher policies um, that you'll be liable for them for a number of years afterwards. So. Wrapping it up, um, how to design with confidence then? Um, identifying the correct person with the correct qualifications. Uh, CSSW is probably the most commonly asked for, though you'll see if you've got experience um, and other qualifications that may be completely appropriate. If a warranty or insurer is involved, uh, make sure you understand their requirements and you're achieving them. Uh, the last thing a developer will want is to employ a waterproofing designer, produce waterproofing design, send it off to the warranty provider, and they come back with a load of conditions saying, can you confirm this, can you confirm this? The waterproofing designer's responsibility and role is to basically satisfy those conditions and hopefully most of them in the first instance. Some questions will always come back, but hopefully um, filter them out straight away. Um, Consider the risk and consequence of failure. Um, obviously, we've seen that some of the warranty providers require more than one form of waterproofing in certain scenarios. Obviously, if the risk dictates you should have more than one form, then obviously um, take that into your design philosophy as well. It's see it as a minimum, not as what you should be doing. So don't fear about going above it as well. Make sure you ultimately you'll be responsible for it. So make sure you're happy and satisfied with what you're presenting and what, you, what you're basically designing. Um, and consider the available insurance policies. So um, insurance back guarantees for the end work, warranty providers, uh, inst installation warranties, all these sorts of things as well. Product guarantees, do they feed into it? So there's a full package. 
From a practical perspective, uh, make sure that the relevant design and details are available. So rather than just having a dotted line on the outside of a structure saying waterproofing, what is that waterproofing? How the overlaps achieved? Is there service penetrations or these sorts of things? Use experienced and qualified installers. Uh, generally speaking, especially when the warranty providers are involved, they will ask for evidence that the installer, be it the ground worker, main contractor or so forth, has got experience um, with the materials that are being used. And most of the manufacturers these days will offer supervision and site guidance on that if, if they're not to speed straight away, but that's what ultimately they should be looking for. A method statement identifying the build stages um, and that feeds into buildability. Um, very common mistake I see people making, um, very large basement excavation, putting a crane in, they form a crane pad once the excavation is being carried out, so a concrete uh, slab effectively, cranes built off of it, crane is used to bring all the materials into the excavation, crane disappears, that crane pad remains in situ and the rest of the concrete is poured around it to form the ultimate basement slab with waterproofing underneath it. However, we've now got this lovely concrete disc in the middle which they didn't put the waterproofing underneath in the first instance. If you were going for an external system, it would make sense to put the waterproofing, even though it's a very small local area, under that crane pad initially, and then obviously that can tie in with the rest when it's um, ready to do so. It's not impossible to get around it if you don't do that, but just thinking for those build stages can save money and make buildability um, much easier. Just two more slides, I think. Um, buildability, um, the degree at which a building design facilitates its construction. Uh, one of the things that all of the warranty providers ask for, and what you should be doing as a waterproofing design anyway, is linking the waterproofing to the damp proofing. So making sure there's a link between the external waterproofing and up to or above DPC, as you can see in the right hand side here. Now, there's a very brief example in this section here. On the left hand side, we have an external waterproofing system. And I don't know if you can make out, but in the bottom left hand corner of that section, there is a, a basement flat effectively. So they've got a type A external system System, which you can see the blue line returns up. It goes into the structure as a, a low level DPC, which is actually a below external ground level. But on the inside of the cavity wall, the blue line goes up and then returns out. Now, effectively, that has linked up with DPC. So waterproofing to DPC has been achieved. Um, but although that's a window detail, there is no effect of cavity tray, dip tra drip tray or anything like that. On the right hand side, the photo of this actual section, you can see they've taken the waterproofing across the cavity and up onto the slab on the left hand side underneath the block work, which you can, if you look at both drawings together in a photo, you can see how that works out. Effectively, what they've done now is they've achieved waterproofing to DPC still, um, but they've actually formed a barrier stopping water getting down into the lower cavities. So it's a better design. Now, why did he do that when I asked? him effectively the guy who's installing this when looking at the left hand side he said as he built the external leaf of masonry and he was putting his membrane down a self-adhesive membrane um he couldn't do it it was sticking to things it wasn't adhering properly it was just really really messy so he found approaching it like on the right hand side was much easier now as a detail that would be more buildable in my opinion so making sure it's not just pretty on a design and you can follow the line the whole way up it has to actually be achievable in terms of constructing it in the first place and just very briefly, things to look at. Uh, these are all BSA 102 kind of um, flavors. If a leak is found, could, if, if it occurs, could it be found? So think about repairability of a design. Um, I don't want to say it's a bad thing, but BSA 102 sort of sets up for failure a little bit. So basically it asks you, if this goes wrong, what are the consequences first off? And if the consequences are unacceptable, how would you re remediate them? So can you find the leak? And even if you can find it, is it possible to effectively repair it? If the answer is no to one of those questions, it's probably a design worth revisiting to, to improve that scenario. Um, are there things in place to reduce leak occurring? We looked at the land drainage with Premier and LABC say where possible, introduce it. Does the design take future conditions into consideration? Um, I would suggest that's not such a relevant thing in terms of the warranty providers because they, again, as I mentioned, the grades, the one, two, and three, you'll be warrantying that structure, that use of that space as a particular use. So if at a later date within the warranty or guarantee period, it's changed, maybe from a garage to a gym, it will be warranted as a garage. So if it's not appropriate as a gym, that wouldn't be covered by the warranty. So not so much a consideration, but definitely something worth just keeping in mind um, if, it, if it does follow on. And just 
two um, examples just to give some of you a bit of flavor of what's out there. So on the right hand side, um, that's the outwing weatherald case. So we've got a land drain, that's great, but obviously it's positioned too high. So we're not removing the water pressure from the full um, depth of waterproofing, uh, which some of the things ask for. And on the left hand side, we've got a sandwich detail where we've got a waterproof membrane buildup within the construction. So on the retaining wall loaded with some internal um, loadings as well, block work wall and concrete and so forth. That's great. But if that waterproofing fails, it's going to be very difficult to identify where that leak is um, and, and therefore rectify it. So both of those designs, although they've got waterproofing in them, um, they're not necessarily uh, great. So that's it from me, Andy, um, to the bad examples. Hope you found that of use um, and interest. Um, sort of whisk through it a little bit at the end there. Um, but yeah, happy to take any questions or comments. Well, Michael, many, many thanks for that. Um, I mean, like starting right back at the beginning of your presentation, who knew? Well, certainly I didn't know only 1% of the total cost of waterproofing um, uh, in terms of building construction was actually kind of building, and 80% um, it can potentially be the cost of the litigation. To me, it sounds like our waterproofing guys need to be getting more money. <laughs> Water's expensive when it gets into things, so um, yes. <laughs> yeah, well... Yeah, folks, just to kind of let you know, we are slightly overrunning time-wise. If you can bear with us here just for about another 10 minutes, we'll try and get finished for about 10 past um, 10. past ten. So I'm just going to get rattled right into the, the questions here. Michael, so question number one just for you um, comes from Lee Lee Cho. Uh, what are your thoughts on split liability for product warranties, i.e. type A from... X manufacturer and type B from another or membrane from one manufacturer and joint from another. What are your thoughts? Um, from a design aspect, um, I'm pretty happy with it because as a design, as long as the materials are all compatible with each other, there should be no reason why that would work as a, an overall strategy. Um, in terms of single source liability, if it is possible to obtain all the materials from one source, I think that is probably the best way to go because obviously that reduces uh, the places that you need to go and the, the uh, potential for split liability. So single source as a preference, yes, definitely. From a technical point of view, I always try and look at things worst case scenario. If it did go wrong, the fact that let's say a, a legal case was born from it, the fact that there's two different materials from two different suppliers used in one scheme, as long as they're compatible, that shouldn't really um, in, introduce any liability to the design. If the materials fail, however, because they've been manufactured incorrectly, the fact you've used somebody else's material with their material wouldn't dissolve their liabilities for supplying a faulty material. So. Hopefully that sort of all the aspects come in there. So hopefully I've answered that all right. All right. So well, next question from Tracy McLeod's. Um, if there is a third party IBG, where do the likes of NHBC and LABC warranty stand if it fails? Surely they should just go back to the third party. Your thoughts? Oh, interesting one. Um, have I come across that if I'm honest personally myself? Um, I would have thought if um, a waterproofing scheme has been installed on an NHBC site, for example, and the specialist contractor has also issued an insurance back guarantee, if there was an issue with the waterproofing, I would assume the NHBC or warranty provider would look to activate that insurance back guarantee. So rather than it coming out of the warranty provider's coffers, they'd look to use that guarantee that was paid for effectively in the beginning. Now, whether or not that goes in with the admin and is it locatable at a later date, nine years later, is another question. Um, but I would assume if there was a, a guarantee covering that aspect of the build um, still in play, the warranty provider would act upon it. I would, I would hope anyway, that's what I would assume. Right, okay. Well, I've got a couple of questions just on this. I'm just going to try and combine it from David and, and Mark. Uh, what is the responsibility of a CSSW severe in the event of a claim? And just to add to that, is it the company that is liable or the named individual that is liable? Oh, okay. Um, I knew having insurance as a topic was going to be interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, 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 now, if you're acting as a CSSW member of staff within an organization, very likely you're going to be covered by the organization's insurance. So if you, um, for whatever reason, make a mistake or introduce liability for whatever reason, it will be your company's PI that picked that up. Now, 
I am aware that there are some companies out there who have got their CSSW inspectors or, in, or surveyors or designers to have their own PI insurance. So effectively removing the liability from the main contractor or the um, manufacturer, whatever it is, away. Now, technically speaking, I, I don't want to say this loosely, that I think that might be fraud to a certain degree because it's sort of um, you're di diluting it. If you are a contractor, and you install stuff and you have a separate company that does design and coincidentally 90 percent of the designs from this design agency go to this one contractor i think it would be fair to say there is a conflict of interest there and that there is a commercial link between the two so it might you might find that if there was a problem the insurers would throw it back at you say no sorry you, you you've tried to pull the wool under our eyes so no, we're not covering you. Can't say for sure, but um, that that would be my take on it if, if, if I was asked on the spot, as I have been. Okay. Well, our next one, I think, will also appeal to our, our damp proofing specialists out there as well as the waterproofing specialists. Um, question from um, Neil McIver. What is your thoughts on timber frame below ground in a two-type system that is not part of the structure to the waterproofing system? Uh, personally, um, I avoid... I, I, a fan of avoiding timber below ground wherever I, I can. I'm actually working, coincidentally, I was talking to a job yesterday where they're using a, a piled foundation slab um, and there's some external high level where they've got timber frame, but the sole plate on the design is actually beneath ground level. Now I'm trying my best to get them to, to raise that up so the sole plate's at least above DPC level. So my, my, my very sort of straightforward answer is no. Timber below ground, I'd avoid it where possible. The only place I may consider it where the timber is not part of the structure is if it's inside of a cavity drain system. So you've got a form of waterproofing and, and a, a very good vapor barrier to a certain degree. So that's the only place I'd probably uh, be happy with it or satisfied with it. All righty. Well, next one comes from Rami Tarif. Uh, my, my apologies if I pronounce your surname incorrectly there, Rami. Um, this is all about liability of leaks. Um, many large-scale projects dictate the warranty starting date to be 365 or 400 days following the date of substantial completion. In between those periods, who would be liable for the leaks? Um, that needs to be decided. No, it, yeah. uh, it has yeah. to be written down. There was another job I was working on, uh, which if you've done one of my training courses, I discussed this to a certain degree. Um, there was a development where there was a, a new build house, two story basement, six story um, in total, so four stories above ground. Basement was the first thing that was finished. Specialist contractor came in, installed a cavity drain system with the pumps, signed it all off, um, gave over the guarantee and effectively the service um, manual. So basically for the first year or whatever, we need to service it twice. And so every year after that, we need to service it. Um, the basement was finished 18 months before the rest of the house was finished and it was handed over to the end client. And that paperwork about servicing the pump was not looked at until it was handed over to the customer over a year and a half later. So that pump had been sitting there with no attention for a year and a half. And it did fail. And as a result, uh, obviously things happened, it went, went to court. And the reason was there was nobody written down as who is responsible for that period in between so if you're a contractor installing the waterproofing and you're coming off site who do you know is going to be looking after your waterproofing whilst you're away especially if it's a maintainable system like a pump system for example you should have that point of contact that transfer of liability to somebody else on record somewhere if you don't i would argue they could come back to you saying well you're the learned party in this you should have told us we need to look after this for the next year whilst you're not here so we're blaming you so it's all to do with admin and getting names on paper i'm afraid but yeah making sure you know who's taken on that liability when you've left uh, it sounds like almost a pass in the buck exercise uh, I, I, I try to avoid saying that but yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, here, yeah, Michael, this next question is a biggie, so bear with me here as I'm kind of reading this. It comes from Graham Henderson. Hi, Graham. Um, with reference to NHBC and others, requirements on who and what, as an installer where we are not the waterproof design specialist, quite often the information um, is completely unknown. Is this not bizarre, given the knowledge and expertise that should be on a design team? Surely CSS qualified installers must raise this point. If they don't, are installers in a dangerous position where they are potentially taking on the role of the waterproof design specialists? Do you agree 
that this should be thrown back to the design team before continuing with any installation? Um, yes, I, agree. I do agree. Um, there is a, a grey area there because um, as a scenario, if I designed um, a waterproofing scheme as a designer, but that's the only involvement I had, and then a waterproofing specialist came along and installed it, um, if that waterproofing specialist knows that something in my design is incorrect, they have the duty of care to identify that and not install it effectively. They say, no, this is wrong. The fact that I've done a design does not dissolve their liabilities as being a learning party in that. So there is a gray area there. Um, I think in terms of getting it back to where it should be, um, where it's going and where to a certain degree it's almost at already, is that the CSSW person, the designer, should be involved at quite a lot of the stages, so including installation to a certain degree. So as a designer myself, I don't get my hands dirty per se. I don't actually get pick up the tools and do the work. I'll design it, and very often I will set a schedule for following up the design as it's being installed. So that, again, that brings much more the liability to myself. Um, although, unfortunately, as an installer, um, if you've got experience and certainly if you've got qualifications in waterproofing and you weren't involved in original design, you will carry some liability still because you will be seen as a learned party in that in that process to what degree depends on the actual scenario but um, it is a gray area I, I, I do agree i do agree no, no well next question um from jamie jamie i'm, I'm a wee bunch of how to pronounce your surname i think it's this journey this journey um is bs8102 currently being rewritten now i can actually <laughs> give you a slight answer to this our steve and james i know are very much involved in this michael how much you know about it how much can you involve uh how much can you tell us um it's pretty much uh it's not, not that it's 100 guarantee but it's pretty much a given that yes it is in the process of being revised um a suggested panel has been put forward of people to do that um i think it just needs to be cleared by bsi's um board of directors or management there's a level which it just needs to be signed off um and then hopefully the process will all begin and that is in my opinion imminent so mm. how long it takes we're, we're I, we won't be seeing BS8102 2020, I don't think. Um, certainly 2021 at the earliest, I'd imagine. Um, but yes, it is in the process. And a lot of the grey areas, especially with the, the grades, like the car park is a grade one, they're going to be looked at. So yes, it is going to be um, looked at. And hopefully we'll see a, a new polished version coming out soon. Okay. Well, guys, here, um, I'm just going to ask very, very quickly two more questions. There is actually a stack load of questions here. <laughs> it seems a waterproofing guys love asking questions. I won't give it that. Many thanks, guys. But two more questions here that will fire at you. Um, firstly, um, do this is actually to do with internal waterproofing. Um, this, do want to provide us except two systems, both applied internally, such as a slurry type A and cavity membrane type C? Um yes is uh the the, the straightforward answer um however you'd have to make sure uh one as a design and as an installer that you're not um what's the word compromising the type a system so if you put a waterproof tanking slurry on the inside and then fix the cavity drain system to it obviously your cavity drain fixings are going to penetrate that type a system now from a real term you have put holes in it which in my opinion would negate the full benefit of that type a system if you wanted to consider it as a complete type a system when you install the type c system you should be looking to make sure that the fixings are done in such a way that it doesn't interrupt the integrity of that type a system so using resin um, anchors chemical anchors things like that to put the fixings in with instead now uh, a lot more work but in my opinion that would then give you a full type a and a tool full type c and just as a side note the type a even if you do penetrate it without seeing the fixed things it's still going to do a big or introduce a big benefit to that scheme in at least slowing water down so not a bad idea all right and last question for you today and by the way folks what i'm going to do is i'm going to fire these off to michael and uh, i'm not going to promise you anything from michael if he can get back to you but i will fire them off and if Mike, there is a lot of questions and if michael can get back to you Great, but the last question, a little bit softer and a little bit more flippant. Um, from Richard Hall, great presentation, Michael, but what please is meant by wet ducks can't run? Oh, the, an acronym I wasn't expecting to take off quite as it did, but it seems to work, so it's good. 
Um, wet ducks can't run was um, a, a phrase I came up with to help people remember the requirements of BS8102. Now, if you take the letters from each of those words, uh, wet ducks can't run, W-D-C-R, um, they basically stand for the first <laughs> letters in um, what you should be thinking about when looking at waterproofing design. So W for wet is water. So you should always consider there'll be water pressure on the outside. So thinking about burst water mains, things like that. Ducks, D stands for defects. Um, you should assume, even with the best intentions, there'll be a problem with the waterproofing, a defect somewhere, although minor, um, there will be a defect. Can't, C for consequence, is, uh, is for consequence. So what would be the consequence of water pressure against the defect would be a leak. Is it a grade three environment? If it's habitable and it leaks, that's not going to be acceptable. Mm -hmm. If the consequence is not acceptable, then we come on to the ducks running, R, which stands for remedial work. Is remedial work possible for the installed system? If the answer is no, then it will be questioned whether or not it complies with the standards. So wet ducts can't run, water, defects, consequence, remedial works, if it helps you remember it. There you go, guys. You've got the, what is it? They call it an acrosism or something like along those lines. Yeah. I've not had enough coffee, think of these. Bottles. I haven't thought anything better yet, but um, wet ducks running seems to have taken up. I do actually know someone's had it tattooed on them, a wet duck running. No so, way. That's not yeah. even Boston or something like that, is it? I won't mention any names. Maybe it helps me yeah. through their exam. I don't know. All right. Well, guys, here, just to kind of let you know, if you are looking for additional information, there's certainly several resources here. You can go to the PCA's uh, waterproofing document library. There's a whole ton of waterproofing related documents, best practice guidance, the whole works. There is also the professional and training sections. Just to let you know, our training is going to hopefully be back up and running soon. Sue, our wonderful Sue, is just looking into how we make this safe and good and just make sure everyone's feeling safe and secure when they go there. So we'll update you hopefully in the next couple of weeks on that. And also you can get further information just from the providers there, NHBC, GPI, Premier Guarantee and LABC. Just also note as well, I do know that there is new manuals from Premier Guarantee and LABC now available. I, I will try uh, when we push out the the replay i'll try and include them in just for everyone in there just um as well just to let you know what's actually coming up our cpd series continues next week this time it moves into our invasive weed side of things under the radar buddlier and bamboo why aren't we concerned this is being led by jim glaisler of the the, the not weed company and also just for all our pca members just remember every tuesday tune in tuesday this is your show, your forum, your place where you can um, let us know any concerns that you've got. And the web link there is just at the bottom there that you can use to kind of sign up to any of our webinars coming up, which is just www.property-care.org forward slash webinars. Um, lastly, but not least, I just want to say a big thank you to yourself, Michael. Fantastic presentation. Okay. It's great. Um, a big thank you uh, as well to our audience. Loving the engagement, guys. Loving all the questions. And um, certainly, I suppose, saying enough from me, a thank you from myself and everyone at the PC for tuning in. And hopefully, we catch you next week in the next of our CPD series. So um, goodbye from myself. Goodbye from Michael and everyone. Uh, we hope you have a lovely day. Cheers, Bye, everyone. Bye.